Tim Inkster is the co-founder with Elka Inkster of the Porcupine's Quill based in Erin, Ontario. Welcome to the Bibliophile. Thank you. We're here today in the, the press room. That, looks, that looks out so, over a yeah. sunny garden and a, a branch of the West Credit River. You were talking earlier about interviewing David Godin in Boston, and uh, David Godin, as you probably know, comes from an extremely moneyed background. I do not, but I do have easy access to the credit, as it's called, in the backyard, which, which I'm told is the secret of my success in literary publishing. Credit. Access to credit. It just flows <laughs> right past you. Yeah. There's a mosquito that's flying around that we're trying to kill here. We're doing a series on publishing houses. I'd like you to talk a bit about your philosophy of publishing. Um, I'm not so sure that it's a philosophy. I was at the U of T at University College uh, studying English. I guess my plan originally was to go on and do graduate work and then teach. But as an undergraduate at U of T, I discovered that the business of the academy of writing essays that were 2,000 words long was getting boring, and it, it was too easy for me, anyway, to fake it. Uh, while I was at the U of T, I got a little bit involved with literary magazines, I did two years in honors English and then I had to drop out for a year because I ran out of money. In the year that I dropped out, I uh, took control of every literary magazine at the U of T that I could get my hands on. So I spent quite a bit of time dealing with the production of the literary magazines. So you didn't really drop out, you were busy as ever, probably learning more too than... Probably, yeah, yeah. except I wasn't attending classes or paying fees. I mean, this would have been the late 1960s. I went into Stan Bevington's Coach House Press. Applied for a job, actually. As what? Anything. Wanted to be close I wanted, to that. I wanted to be part of it. Bevington said uh, no. I was too young that I would be best advised to go back to school and finish my studies. So I did that reluctantly. And that's when I met Dave Godfrey. Godfrey had started the House of Anansi, of course, and then Godfrey got involved with New Press. I was the only employee at Godfrey's Press Porky Peak. Doing what? Well, I was everything at Porky Peak. I was the only employee. Primarily, I was running a little multi-1250 duplicator and printing books two pages at a time because that was the biggest sheet size that would go through a multi. And then folding the pages in half and then hand collating them into 16-page signatures. Very tedious. So it, it wasn't too many years before we realized that I was more interested in the craft of printing than Godfrey wanted to invest in old printing equipment. And Godfrey was always more interested in the editorial side. Content um, versus the book as object. Yeah. I wasn't getting on all that well with Godfrey either, and I applied again at Coach House, 1973 or so, and Bevington said, no, you know too much, you'll cause trouble. So I only ever applied for two jobs in my life, both time at Coach House Press, and the first time I was too young, and four years later, I was too old. Oh, too so smart. that's that's why yeah. I'm self-employed. Okay, so you moved out to Erin by accident because we were living. Elka and I were living in Toronto, and I was working for Dave Godfrey. Actually, when I started working for Press Porky Peak, it was in the basement at 671 Spadina, just a bit south of Bloor on the east side, and that's the building where the House of Anansi started in the basement and then moved up to the ground floor and then moved out and then New Press started in the basement and then moved to Sussex and then Press Porky Peak started in the basement. My first job in publishing was uh, New Press had, had left the basement at 671 some years earlier and there were a large number of cats lived in the building. So my first job was to shovel the cat shit out of the basement. Nice. so that I could have an office. I remember it was a coal chute at the back of the building and this one day I was in the basement and there was a knock on the coal chute doors. From the basement I pushed them open and was blinded by the sun streaming in it. A noted young poet of the day was standing there, Michael Ondaatje, inquiring as to whether Doug Featherling still lived in the furnace room. And I said, no, Featherling's moved out. And on that, she asked me, well, what are you doing down there anyway? And I said, shoveling shit. He went home and wrote the collected works of Billy the Kid. 
and I went back to the business at hand. Now, is this place plaqued? I don't. I don't think so. Should be. It should be. What is it now? I think it's. I think it always was owned by the University of Toronto. Oh. I think they own most of the buildings yeah. on the block, and right. eventually it'll be all knocked down. When Godfrey uh, and Dennis Lee, the poet, and Allen Ginsberg, did you know that? No. The House of Anansi started by three partners, and Allen Ginsberg had a little bit of money in it, right at the very beginning, 1966. If you look at the early catalog of Anansi, Anansi published Airplane Dreams, I think it was called, by Allen Ginsberg. But anyway, House of Anansi is certainly seminal in the beginnings of an indigenous Canadian publishing company. And you, you look at the books that Anansi was making, and they were awful. Uh, badly typeset mm -hmm. and poorly edited, execrably printed, bound to instantly fall apart. But the idea of having a Canadian publishing company that would publish writers who were not dead was a completely revolutionary idea, and as recently as 1966-67. One of your motivations was to do the same thing except in a format. I was always more interested in the production side. You know, and you'd I'm seen what was coming out of these different small presses and felt sure. that you could do better? I remember I had a poetry book by American poet Charles Wright, can't remember what it was called at that time, and I thought uh, that this was really an exemplary production, and I thought I could do at least as well. And eventually I did. For what we do, there are few people who do it better. Robert Bringhurst came out with his Surface of Meaning a book design in Canada, and in the appendix, appendix number three, he counts up the book designers who have received Alcuin awards, and I have more than anybody else in the past 35 years, which is partially because I'm getting long in the tooth, and I started before Andrew Steves. He's closing, closing ground in. on me, and, and I support that. I, I mentioned earlier that I have made provisions in my last will and testament for the future financial health of Gaspar Press. Well, perhaps we could look then at your oeuvre. First of all, how many books have you published so um, far, The Porcupine's Quill, roughly? 200, 250, something like that. Okay, so it's an accomplishable task to collect your books. Yeah, so if one would want to do that. I mean, some of them are better than others. Yeah, I would think, you know, if you're a completist, though, that someone, would be Someone a like John Metcalf. Yeah that it would be a really fun exercise to go after all of your books. Maybe the first question then would be which is the scarcest? Which had the smallest run? We started out publishing poetry because when I was at the U of T I wrote poetry. At one time I got pretty good at it. Ralph Gustafson included me in uh, the Penguin book of modern Canadian verse. That was a long time ago. And then what happened with the, the poetry was, after Elka and I had started the Porcupine's Quill, we owed a lot of money for the machinery. So we did a lot of contract book printing money for other little presses, mm -hmm. because we had the machinery and that wasn't very common. What year did you set up into that? The Porcupine's Quill started in September of 1974. And the first book that we published was a book of poems by Brian D. Johnston who was my best man when Elka and I got married. Brian Johnson is now, of course, the film critic from Acclaims magazine and claims to have met Mick Jagger of the Rolling Stones twice. Fame. Oh, he's touched fame. Come close. Just well, like Margaret he, Trudeau. Yeah. Um, <laughs> other books that we published very early on, like in the, in the mid-1970s, included the first book of poems by E.J. Carson, who then went on to distinguish himself in a number of senior executive positions in Canadian publishing, including president and CEO of Penguin Canada. We also published an early book by Brian Henderson, who is currently the publisher at Wilfrid Laurier University Press. We published an early book of poems by Robert Dixon, who grew up in Aaron Village, and this is a good story, went to Aaron High School, but Robert's mother was Francophone, and after Robert graduated from Aaron High, he went to school, I think, uh, Trois-Rivières, then did graduate work at the Sorbonne in Paris, and then came back to Canada and moved to Sudbury and taught at Laurentian in the French department, and Robert Dixon, eventually became one of the key founders of the Franco-Ontarian 
cultural movement uh, based in Sudbury. We knew him because he came back to Aaron to visit his mother from time to time, and so he came into the shop. And then I thought it would be amusing, not that I ever expected to make a dime, if the Porcupine's Quill published a collection of this guy's poetry en français, but published it in the village of Aaron, mm. which is, if anything, not a bilingual place uh, at all. So we did. The book was called Un Ban Trantien. It included one poem in particular called Au Nord de Notre Vie, To the North of Our Lives. And that lyric, Au Nord de Notre Vie, was eventually recorded by a Franco-Ontarian rock ensemble called Cano. You, you might remember Lighthouse. Cano was the Franco-Ontarian equivalent the founder was André Paimont, who was a playwright, and he was a hippie, and he raised buffalo on a commune outside of Sudbury. Mm -hmm. And his sister, Rachel, sings Au Nord de Notre Vie on one of Cano's albums. The song, it is haunting like a loon on a northern lake. I mean, I, I can't sing, or, or I try. I, I can hear it in my head. Maybe it's on YouTube. Maybe. So we published this book of poems by this Aaron Village high school graduate who eventually became famous in Franco-Ontarian cultural circles. And then 24 years later, after our publication, he was awarded the Governor General's Award in French for French poetry, which is the first and only time an Anglophone has ever or will ever win the Governor General's Award for poetry en français. And he got his start with Porcupine. He got his, and he actually was very generous when he won the Governor General's Award in making a point of saying, although we didn't publish his first book, it was one of his early books, how important that was to have that kind of validation at an early point in his career. We published Jane Urquhart before she was Jane Urquhart. Yeah, what was that one? Uh, we didn't Globe. publish her first book of poems, but we did a book of poems with her called The Little Flowers of Madame de Montespan. And then we also published Jane Urquhart's first and only book of short fiction called Stormglass. And that came out in the same year that McClellan and Stewart released The Whirlpool. Okay. And then she was on her way. So you're giving us highlights from what you've published early on. I wonder uh, if being a completist is out of the question, or at least it's not something that the prospective collector would be interested in. I wonder if you could reflect on what you might collect within your output of 200 odd I don't think of... I I'm a collector, and I'm talking from the perspective of someone who is interested in your press because, well, because, for example, you always use beautiful laid paper. Behind you there's uh, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, there's 32,000 sheets of that stuff in and, that pile. D and typically the card stock is on laid paper as well. Oh, Blake, I mean, that, that's an interesting story about the matte cover stocks. Because mm -hmm. when we started publishing in the mid-1970s, we never sold very many copies of, of anything. But really? what we were selling, we were selling to small independent trade bookstores. That was the market. And we never, in the 1970s and 1980s, we never sold anything in the Kohl's bookstores because the mall store format was too small. It didn't have enough linear feet of shelf space to include a niche product like mm. we were making. The Kohl's shells were full of Daniel Steele and yeah. whatever, American paperbacks, which sold in volume. And W.H. Smith had a somewhat more Catholic taste in the product that, that they sold, but even, even so, we didn't sell much. So when chapters burst upon the scene, you know, Larry Stevenson, we were initially enthusiastic because the big box format, store format, was new in Canada. And we thought, okay, instead of having this small mall store format with a limited amount of shelf space, the big box format has miles of shelf space. And we figured, so he's got to put something on the top shelf, on the top floor, at the back of the building. Mm -hmm. And that'll be us. But at least if we're in there, we'll have some chance of selling, whereas in the Kohl's format, 
we had no chance because we were never there. So initially we thought this might be a good thing. And we did try to do some marketing things with them and we tried to shift the kind of product that we were making. I mean, those were the times when almost all of our covers were full process color and laminated. Glossy. And deliberately so because it was obvious from the beginning that returns were going to be an issue. You felt that they were sexier and that by doing that you'd be able to sell more in the big box stores. Partially yes, and also partially because we wanted to be able to take the returns yeah. and have the books resaleable. These would be scuffed up and scuffed. Yeah, because yeah. I mean, the, this, the tooth on the paper yeah. is aesthetically very pleasing, mm -hmm. uh, but it also picks up oil off your fingers almost immediately. Yeah. And so this kind of product, a complete physical uh, a collection of. Uh, poems by Shane Nielsen, who happens to be my family physician and who actually moved to Aaron Village specifically because he wanted to get to know me better and because he said that his dream was to be published by the Porcupine's Quill. And you might even be able to hear in the background that's a Solby Automina Binder running upstairs is putting the covers on the last of the first run of Dr. Nielsen's book. And yes, it has that laid textured card stock as the cover, as opposed to the laminated, glossier yeah. stock. So you started off with these, you yeah. went to that in part because of the introduction of the big box phenomenon. Stock. Yeah. And then we got caught in the bankruptcy of Jack Stoddard's General Distribution Services in 2002, which is right around the time that uh, Heather Reisman took control of Chapters and in Indigo and took massive advantage of the bankruptcy of GDS. At that point, we realized that the returns issue was just beyond the beyond. What does that mean? Well, once upon a time, before Chapters in Indigo, we were distributed by the University of Toronto Press. This would have been early 1990s. Okay. And I can remember signing the standard publisher distribution agreement with UTP at that time, which provided for an allowable returns rate of 18%. And mm -hmm. if a publisher incurred returns in excess of 18%, there was an escalating schedule of penalties. Okay. So a, a client publisher of UTP distribution Which expected did? to police returns and keep them no more than 18%. If the bookseller doesn't sell them and they want to return them, you can't, you can't stop, stop them. Stop them no, but, no, but the, the distributor's argument is that it was irresponsible of the publisher to have encouraged the bookseller to, to buy, buy irresponsibly. Name. Right. right which is bullshit. Yeah, but then, then Chapters in Indigo came in, and then it turns out that actually the business model for Chapters with the big box store format expects to return 82% of everything they buy. But did you know that going in? No, no, of course no. not. It gets worse. And then what happened, particularly after 2002, when general distribution went bankrupt, Heather Reisman perfected the art of the virtual return. The virtual return is a situation in which chapters decides that they want to return a copy of a Porcupine's Quill book. So when they make that decision, they issue a debit note to my distributor, which is now the University of Toronto Press again. We were at UTP before, we went to GDS, we lost a lot of money. I mean, actually, Elk and I lost $65,000 personally when Jack Stoddard went down and now we're back at UTP again. So Sorry, because what? The, all of the, the books that they had distributed on your behalf came back to you or didn't come back to you or you weren't paid for didn't them? Didn't come or? back. An enormous amount of our stock was liquidated by the court and in fact right as GDS was going down, Chapters returned 65 tractor trailer loads of Canadian publishers books and then these books got remaindered by the court and Chapters was able to buy, buy them, them back, back at pennies per copy and then return them to the original publisher at full retail price. Brilliant! We're sort of getting off my collecting angle here uh, with this, but I don't want to well, cut we're you short we were, to we're either. Talking, we're t we were talking about, about covers. matte covers. Yes. And we, we started with matte covers and then because of commercial pressure from what we thought was a commercial opportunity with Chapters in Indigo, we moved to a different, more commercial look 
totally because of that yeah lost our shirts now you lost your shirt again I'm, I'm, this is we interesting get, we get to the point of the the art of the virtual return the virtual return is chapters decides they want to return a porcupine's quill book right when they make that decision they issue a debit note to our distributor our distributor has no choice but to honor the debit note and in so doing the distributor deducts that debit note from any money that might otherwise be owing to us. So we pay for the return once. Mm -hmm. But then, some months later, when Chapters actually gets around to physically returning the book that they thought some months ago they were thinking of returning, they issue another debit note. So at one time, well, at its worst was about 2003, our returns levels from Chapters and in Indigo hit 143% of sales. They were returning one and a half times what they bought. Which is impossible, of course, other than what they've they, done with they their were, books. They were returning the same book more than once. At that point, we realized that that whole commercial opportunity was when you, sign, when you signed the agreement with chapters, you must have known that they had the right to return whatever they didn't sell. Sure, but we have no control over chapters. I mean, we don't deal with them. No, we deal with through, UTP, UTP well, you, deals with chapters. Well, okay, but you knew that UTP's negotiation with chapters would include chapters' right to return anything yeah. they didn't sell, right? Yeah, but we didn't know that chapters would start returning the same book more than once. Yeah, but you must have gotten some sort of retribution from that. No, we got no retribution. No, we just paid paid through the notes. But you they can't do that. Yes, so they did do that. They did do that. But you can't you can't that's not <laughs> all I can just all I can, can do is I can tell I know Hamish Cameron who is the vice president of distribution at UTP very well. I've known him for years. I can go to my friend Hamish and say, Hamish I don't like this and Hamish says, Yeah, I don't like it either. So end of argument. So at, at some point, around 2003, I realized we cannot continue to deal with chapters. Mm. It doesn't matter if they are the biggest book retailer in the country, we cannot continue to allow this to continue. Mm. So You're losing money because of it. Yes, that's right. So in 2003, we said, okay, well, we can't stop chapters from special ordering our books, so we don't even try, but we no longer attend chapters sales presentations twice a year and we no longer make any attempt to sell our books to chapters and so what happens is after you make that decision in 2003 then chapters starts returning everything that they've got in the warehouse including books porcupine's quill books that they bought by the hundreds for pennies in the bankruptcy of gds which they then kept returning at full retail price which utp kept paying for Despite the fact... And it kept coming out of your account. Yes. And then yeah. eventually, you get, you know, in 2000, late 2007, we got to a point where Chapters has no more books to return. So at this point, having made the decision in 2003 that we have to constructively disengage from Chapters, which is a little different than not dealing with them at all, at that point, we realized that the market for our book is individuals the kind of book buyer who buys a book once and the book stays sold, doesn't come back. So at that point, you can go back to a more 19th century mm -hmm. look, mm -hmm. which is why we're back to the matte paper. <laughs> okay. So the thing, like you, you're accusing me of being rambling, no, I'm not. but if I'm you, if you ask a complicated question, yes. you get a complicated answer. <laughs> well, thank you. That brings us back then to the physical object. Yeah and the fact that you're now catering to the book reading and book loving public directly. So how are you doing that? Increasingly with with e-tailers. Our, our biggest account is Amazon.com in okay. Seattle. Although it's not a particularly lucrative account, uh, their returns rates are very low, which mm -hmm. is good. The Same bad thing is that they're big enough that they can demand 55 percent discounts and yeah. they can also demand that we pay the freight to put our stock in their warehouse in Nevada. So after we give away 55% discounts plus pay freight and pay 10% author royalties, the amount that's left is virtually nothing. Okay. So um, the ideal situation is for readers to go directly to your website. We, do, we don't have secure shopping cart technology on our website, but we do 
have bookseller status with eight books, and okay. we have buy buttons on most of our title pages on our web pages that click click and a potential customer can buy a book online through eight books and we are not only the publisher but we are also the bookseller in that case. I see. Okay. And so why don't you have a secure uh, website? It cost money. Everything costs money. We just, we just spent the last eight years developing the database that underpins the new website that we put in place uh, last fall cost about $50,000. I'm speaking with Tim Inkster, who's the co-founder of the Porcupine's Quill, based in Erin, Ontario, next to the credit. credit. A branch of the West Credit. I'd like to talk from the collector's perspective and ask you to identify some of the books that you're most proud of having published. One early book that comes to mind is we did, for us, a large format edition of an alphabet book by a Chilean poet and artist, Ludwig Zeller, who was a political refugee. I think, I think Zeller was cabinet minister under Allende in Chile and then had to get out and I came to Toronto where, where we met him. And interestingly enough, Zeller used the same kind of 19th century steel engravings that we were talking about earlier in his collages and we did oh, he provided them yeah he had these things and then he cut them out and rearranged them and made surrealist collages out of them and we did one alphabet book with Zeller called Alpha Collage that won a silver medal at the book design competition in Leipzig which has been going on and off since the 14th century. So that's, that was a very big deal. And, and at that time, oh, you know, the mosquitoes in your hair. At that time, this would have been early 1980s, I think. Canada, of course, did not recognize East Germany. So my medal was shipped to the East German ambassador to Washington, who drove up in a motorcade from Washington, D.C., and hosted a reception in my honor at a hotel in downtown Toronto, uh, <laughs> at which I was presented with a silver medal from Leipzig. And I remember that the ambassador I got talking to my father, who at that time collected postage stamps. And then some months later, the ambassador had a box of utterly incredible East German postage stamps shipped to my father in Toronto. That's good diplomacy. <laughs> yeah. I guess then what you're suggesting is that, you, that and this might be a potential collecting idea, and that would be getting all of the books that you've won awards for. Yeah, the Alcuin Awards. And, and before that, we worked quite a bit with the poet Robin Skelton when Robin was running the Malahat Review at uh, University of Victoria. And uh, before the Alcuin, the Alcuins, I think, started in the early 1980s. Before that, the Malahat Review had a book design competition that ran for a couple of years for poetry book design and of course we did very very well at that. So yeah, in recent years we tried to document all of our various prizes on our website and we do really quite well, particularly with American competitions, the Independent Publisher Awards, the IPI Awards, and also... Uh, so these are all listed on your website? Yeah, yeah, they are. So, under. you know, if you're looking for a list, that would be a that great one. That would be a place to start, although the only ones you're going to find there are books which are still in print. The books which have gone out of print, which may have won prizes, won't be listed there. But another place to look would be the appendix to Robert Bringhurst's book, The Surface of Meaning, Canadian Book Design. And then there was, there was a few other things that we were involved in. There was a competition called Design Canada, The Look of Books. Alan Fleming, the great Alan Fleming, was involved with that. Alan Fleming is probably the most famous Canadian graphic designer there ever was. He designed the CN logo that you see on every boxcar in the, in the country, uh, amongst other things. The Devil's Artisan, a magazine that we published, just did two special issues quite recently that were edited by Alan Fleming's daughter, Martha about her father and his, his career. I remember the Design Canada Look of Books competition it was a very big deal and had a, a banquet in Ottawa that was a black tie thing. I remember I had to go to uh, Malabar's theatrical costume rental in Toronto to rent a cheap tux in order to be able to get in the door. You, you were mentioning, that reminds me of another story, you were mentioning before that you had interviewed uh, David Godin in Boston not too long ago. 
David Godin and uh, his his friend, the wood engraver Michael McCurdy, once invited me to address the Society of Printers of Boston, which is a very big deal, and has a uh, a most impressive clubhouse in the Beacon Hill, the, the gas lamp cobblestone street section of Boston. This would have been early on, I don't know, mid-1980s or something like that. Of course, I was thrilled to be invited to Boston and, uh, and given such an opportunity, but neither Curdy nor Godin had thought to uh, mention to me that the uh, Society of Printers monthly meetings are black tie, and, <laughs> and that thought never would have occurred Mm -hmm. to me. So I showed up wearing my very best brown leather sports jacket and I remember McCurdy asking if Inkster had no clothes. Um, <laughs> well, you were yeah, definitely yeah, looking the, yeah. well, I was, the right Well, I was part. forgiven on the grounds that I was, I, that I was Canadian. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> An ignorant the, Canadian. Because, you know, talking about awards, I think actually it was that same Ludwig Zeller book at that time, we were doing a little bit of hand binding. Which Might have do? been a hundred copies of that. So that that would be collectible. Yeah, yeah. I think it was the limited edition of that. Got an award from the Art Directors Club of New York, a group for people who own ad agencies on Madison Avenue. Just in closing, we've identified awards. As one possible As one angle. possible, yeah. I mean, obviously you want as many people to admire your books and to hold them and obviously yeah, to read them. Yeah, we don't, well, we talked a bit about Alpha Collage and we did a limited edition. Early on, we did, when we were doing some hand binding, I remember some poetry books. There was a nice book we did called The Book of Numbers by Paul Dutton. There was a book by Steve McCaffrey that we gave the nth degree treatment to. But we weren't making any money at that, and it was super labor-intensive. So we got away from the limited edition and the, the more the precious, yeah. yeah, the more collectible. And yeah. now what we try to do is we try to do as excellent a job as we can at making a popularly priced book that will make certain authors or poets or, or wood engravers is, is one of our our specialties, you know. Yes, like yes. Concord of Sweet Sounds is a recent collaboration with Jer Brendera Brandis, who's a wood engraver from Stratford. I've got one of the ones you've done earlier by him. We uh, did, we met him, Shakespeare? we met him at uh, the Ways Goose in Grimsby very early on, and uh, he was selling letterpress artist prints of his engravings, and I had this idea that we could photograph them and do an inexpensive offset edition of his work, which I thought would make his work more accessible to a wider range of people. And I even said, you know, we have no trouble putting a notice in the book explaining, like, these are offset reproductions. We do not intend these to be fake prints. So we're, we're not trying to fool anybody. We eventually did publish a first book with Brenda O'Brandis. It was called Wood Ink and Paper, 1980. But it took us about four years before he would let us do that because he felt that the quality of the reproduction wouldn't do justice to his engraving mm -hmm. and we would make a mess of it. And, but we didn't. Then we became actually very talented at reproducing engravings. And Wood Ink and Paper is now, I think, in its ninth printing and has sold 8,000 copies. I mean, it, it's taken us 30 years, but it still sells two or 300 copies a year. And this particular book, Concord of Sweet Sounds... That's the most recent collaboration that we, we've done with them. Musical instruments in Shakespeare. Again, these woodcuts are... Absolutely. Not woodcuts, not woodcuts. No, cuts. sorry, wood, wood, wood engravings. Yeah, wood engravings yes. are done on the end grain of the block. Okay. Wood cuts are with the grain. So the, the wood cuts are a little bit more rustic. Yes, and, yes. Uh, engravings yeah. are, are more precise, Finer. more detailed. And these initials are from the find that we made in the old barn on the hill on the other side of the, the mill pond that my father cut out of copies of Pilgrim's Progress and sorted for me. Except that in order to do the initials for Concord of Sweet Sounds, I think we were missing the O. I digitally made a fake O, but I don't think you can tell. This book is just exquisite. It's a beautiful full book, and it's affordable. It's, it's cheap. Sixteen ninety-five. It's cheap, and um, it's it's printed on acid-free Zephyr antique laid paper. It's sewn into signatures on our 1907 model Smythe National Book Sewing Machine. It's got hand-tipped, uh, colored end leaves front and back. 
yeah. which have no structural purpose. It's just just decorative. Rich but it's, it's red. which ties in with a bit of red printing on the cover. It's got a watercolored reproduction of one of the engravings, which is really hard to do to print that cover because the four color separations tend to make that kind of watercolor just all go muddy. That was a huge technical challenge. Exquisite little book. But it's not precious. You know, no, and, it's and functional, and I think that seems to me, I, the, at the beginning of my questioning, I asked you what your philosophy was. That's right. And it seems to me that we may have just gotten to it here. Perhaps, yeah. And, and, and I said I don't really have one, and then I started into a long explanation of, of how market pressures change, change my philosophy, or maybe shaped it. Yeah. I mean, uh, certainly we, we are aware now, I mean, after 36 years, that what we are very good at is using 20th century offset printing technology to replicate the look and feel of a 19th century letterpress product. And provide it to the public At a price that anyone can afford. It's cheaper than a case of beer, that book. Yeah but it's sewn by hand, signature at a time. And you can get drunk reading this as well, I would think. And I think it, it, I think it still uh, serves the function of making the engraver's work um, better known to, uh, to a wider market than he could do. I mean, Brenda Abrandes has his own publishing company, as you might know, the Brandstead Press, and he does exclusively limited editions, which sell for hundreds and hundreds of dollars a copy because they're so rare. I in no way attempt to, to want to make a, a book like Concord of Sweet Sounds rare. There's a few catalogs. This is our upcoming catalog. And this is actually an interesting corollary. In September, we're publishing a calendar for the first time in collaboration with a group called WEN, the Wood Engravers Network. I'm just looking at Jim Rimmer. The latest issue of The Devil's Artisan. Yeah. Just came out a few weeks ago. You, you were talking about uh, that you're, you're concentrating in your interviews on publishing houses. Uh, Jim Rimmer, of course, died in January. This magazine is a terrific example of the kind of collaboration which exists in the very small literary publishing community in Canada. The cover is designed by Andrew Steves of Gasparo Press, who's one of the associate editors of the magazine, which I publish and also print. The eight-page full-color insert wow. was printed at Coach House Press and donated by Stan Bevington to include in the magazine. Because Stan was deciding to donate the eight page color insert, I got inspired. I'm printing a four color on the interior pages on the Zephyr, just, just to show that I can do that too. And then the keepsake is a, a line of cut of a parrot by Jim Rimmer that was printed digitally on an indigo press at Ampersand Printing in Guelph who have been friends for years. Yes, The Devil's Artisan, or DA, we call it, number 66, is available across the country right now. Wow, and it's, if there's anything that's collectible, this is a beautiful example of something that, uh, that is exactly that. Well, all of your books, we haven't even touched on things like, you know, the content. You've published some terrific literary criticism for example. That's very, very contentious. And we have another book uh, by Eric Ormsby coming out this fall. We are working with George Walker, the wood engraver, on a series of graphic novels. You're holding a book called Back and Forth. Marta Chudolinska is a recent graduate of the Ontario College of Art, where George Walker was one of her professors. Mm -hmm. So we're doing a series of graphic novels in lino cuts by young people. And that book, Back and Forth, was recently shortlisted for the Doug Wright Award Award, which is primarily for comic book yes. illustration. We're doing classic reprints. Uh, we just did a new edition of A Suit of Nettles, which is a famous poem by James Rainey, engravings by Jim Westergaard, who took all of the geese in Rainey's poem and dressed them in Elizabethan costume. Um, and this was, of course, a great challenge because the first edition was published by Macmillan and designed by the great Alan Fleming. The second edition was not done very well and was published by Dave Godfrey's Press Porky Peak after I left the firm and I got an opportunity working with the family to do what I think is the best edition 
of a suit of nettles. So this was a great honor at this point in my career to be able to do that. We were working with P.K. Page right up until she died also in January of this year. And uh, Colin Roses is a new book of 21 Glosses by P.K., which unfortunately took too long uh, mm. to come out. The, the book came out about a year ago and was shortlisted for the Griffin Prize, but P.K. unfortunately didn't live long enough to attend the ceremony. One of the big problems with this book is that I thought that we should really have photographs of each of the poets who were being honored in each of the glosses. Well, troubles ensue when you try to get permission to use people's faces. Anna Akhmatova, for example, you have to deal with the Akhmatova Museum in Moscow, much given to lengthy contracts printed on foolscap paper in the Cyrillic alphabet, which is a challenge. The Akhmatova Museum is also fond of American dollars deposited to numbered bank accounts in New York City. So Cole and Roses took longer to get into print than I had hoped. And shortly before Christmas, just this past Christmas, a friend of P.K. Page told her that they had seen a copy of one of the glosses being sold as wallpaper in the Vancouver Public Art Gallery. And P.K. emailed me and said, do something. So I investigated and found out that that story was fortunately not quite true. But what was true was that an interior design firm had been commissioned to design the inside of a house that was to be auctioned off as a fundraiser for the Vancouver Public Hospital. And this young female designer was a fan of P.K. Pages and had stolen one of the glosses from Cole and Roses and had it written out in calligraphy and then blown up huge and hired a wallpaper firm to make a one-off wallpaper. Without any thought of no, copyright? No. So I got in touch with this woman. I remember it was on a Friday afternoon and she said that you know she would be back to me on the Monday. Well, by the Monday, both the design firm and the wallpaper firm had independently hired legal firms to defend them against my unwarranted attacks. This led to all kinds of ludicrous situations where I had one lawyer with some gravity asking if I was aware that the complete works of William Shakespeare were in the public domain. Yes? Yeah, and, and P.K. And was born in the same year that he was. <laughs> P.K. was at that point in her 92nd year and very much obviously alive and with us. Plus 75 years from now, she'll still be covered. Yes, yeah, that's right. So yeah. that ended up being a huge smozzle and I, I spent an enormous amount of time. Eventually the resolution was that the design firm had to make a significant donation to the Vancouver Public Hospital fundraising drive in P.K.'s name. So uh, having got that done early in January, I informed P.K. that I really felt that somebody owed me a beer. I think it was a Thursday afternoon early in January, there was a knock at our door in the shop here in the village, and it was the manager of the local LCBO, the Liquor Control Board, with a case of Heineken with a note on the case saying, Tim, here is your beer. You have earned it. Thanks, P.K. Six hours later, she died. I have the note that's on the wall by the press. Talk about good publisher-author relations. We had a lot of fun, P.K. and I, um, particularly a, a book, uh, a Brazilian alphabet, uh, was was hilarious. But but that's that's another uh, that's another, another story. story. Yes, the the well, thing after thirty-five years in in literary publishing, you don't end up with any money, but you end up with a wealth of stories. Well, and you know what you have is a legacy here. No one can take this away from you. It seems to me that you're going stronger now than you ever have. I and think in, in many ways, yes. We paid off the machines. We fairly recently paid off the mortgage on the two buildings we have here on the main street. I yeah. don't have as many employees as I once did, but I do have the time and the wherewithal to do what I want to do. And I think I still have an enormous amount that I can contribute. And okay. I'm thrilled that I'm given the privilege of being able to do just that. Well, just then to conclude, it seems to me that the wise collector would go after every single one of your books. And I think looking back, say 50 years from now, your efforts will be acknowledged perhaps 
even more then than they are now. Elka and I were, of course, thrilled just last May. We were each awarded the Order of Canada, which mm -hmm. is a kind of a unique achievement because it, it, it is not unique, but it is not common for a husband and wife to be given the Order of Canada together, each at the same time, for doing the same thing. I can't remember their name, but I understand there was a couple biologists, I think, who worked with monarch butterflies in Mexico, who were similarly honored some years ago. Well, congratulations. Thank you. And thank you very much for uh, taking the You're time welcome. to talk. You're welcome. That was fun. I've been talking to Tim Inkster, who is the co-founder with his wife, Elka, of the Porcupine's Quill in Erin, Ontario. Thanks again.